Good morning, everybody, and welcome uh, to today's webinar. I think we will get started. We still have uh, some people joining and trickling in, but I think the majority have since joined. Um, and if not, they will they'll join us as we go along. So um, good morning. My name uh, is Michelle Sanders. I'm the director of the Clean Water Policy Group here at Transport Canada. Uh, the government of uh, Canada's department that's responsible for, among other things, regulating the marine transportation sector. Uh, we wanted to welcome you today to today's webinar on recent innovations in reducing underwater noise from ships. We are really excited to be gathered uh, with this international audience. We had uh, over 300 participants registered. We know some people will be waiting for the recorded version, but excited to have those of you who have joined us live today. Reducing underwater noise from vessels is a priority for uh, Transport Canada, not only to help address a key threat to many endangered species in our waters, but really to support the broader transition to more sustainable shipping globally. As you are likely aware, the review of the 2014 IMO guidelines for the reduction of underwater noise from shipping is starting next week at the IMO's Ship Design and Construction Subcommittee. Canada, along with many of our international partners, has been leading discussions uh, at the IMO for the past few years to advance this important issue on the international front. The main purpose for the revision of the 2014 guidelines is to ensure that the be they better reflect the current knowledge and scientific evidence around the impact of underwater noise from commercial shipping, as well as to increase uh, overall awareness and uptake and therefore the effectiveness of the guidelines. Today's webinar uh, is intended to provide an overview of some specific recent initiatives addressing underwater radiated noise, which we hope will spark some great discussions before SDC dives into the review of the 2014 guidelines next week. Michael Jasny from Natural Resources Defense Council, who is uh, an underwater noise pollution expert, will be moderating our session today, uh, and uh, as well as presenting the remarkable speakers that we have uh, to share with us their, their, their expertise and, and uh, interesting uh, research that they have underway. So Michael, I will turn it over to you. Thanks, Michelle. Uh, uh, my name is Michael Jasny, and as Michelle said, um, I work for NRDC. I direct the Marine Mammal project uh, for NRDC. We're an environmental uh, NGO based in New York. It's been a privilege for us to partner with Transport Canada on this webinar. And uh, Amelie, if you can turn to the next slide. Um, I also want to acknowledge my colleagues at a number of international environmental organizations who likewise are partners in today's event and will be engaged in the process beginning next week at IMO. Uh, underwater noise has been a, a focus of mine for more than two decades. And in that time, I've seen it grow into a significant marine conservation issue as recognized by the UN General Assembly and, and, uh, and, and other international institutions and uh, a focus of work around the globe. Within this field, the, the case of shipping noise is a particularly urgent one for the international community. And not only because shipping is the leading contributor to ocean noise worldwide, it's because ocean noise from shipping is increasing in many parts of the world, including the Arctic, uh, where in some areas it has more than doubled over the last 10 years. And it's because the best time to consider how to design quieter ships is when we're considering how to design more efficient, lower emission ships. So the work beginning next week at the IMO Ship Design Subcommittee could not be more timely. Uh, next slide. In the first part of today's webinar, you're gonna hear from a few of the companies and government-sponsored projects that are engaged in the work of quieting commercial vessels. Some of these presentations will speak to conventional design methods, uh, such as optimizing propellers, others to more novel approaches. There are four presentations in all, and that'll occupy the next hour of the webinar. The last 45 minutes will be taken up by a group discussion with our panelists. Uh, next slide, Emily. I just uh, want to go through a few housekeeping notes before we begin. First and foremost, this is an interactive webinar, and you should feel free to ask questions of our speakers at any time. To do that is really easy. Uh, you just go to the bottom of your screen and click on the Q&A button. Clicking on that button will open a window, just like a chat window, in which you can type your question. You may see that your question is answered directly in that Q&A window by one of our speakers. When that happens, uh, the question and its answer will just move over to the answered column. This will become clear uh, once, once you start using the, the Q&A. 
Uh, please direct your question, if you can, at a particular speaker or speakers, assuming that you have one in mind. If you have a more general question, please feel free to direct it at the panel as a group. We'll be pulling some of your questions for the panel discussion afterwards. And if you wanna signal your interest in someone else's question, and I'd like to hear an answer to that one too, just click the thumbs up button next to the question. Uh, finally, I wanna note that the webinar is being recorded. And um, as Michelle noted, will be made available after the event. And we'll send a, a link to everyone who's registered. And now uh, let's begin with our first presentation uh, by Michele Viviani. Michele is a professor at the University of Genoa and an investigator in the EU's PIAQUO project, about which more in a moment. He'll be speaking about one of the goals in that project, propeller design by optimization. So please welcome Michele Viviani. Just a moment. You should see the, the you should see the, the, the presentation, I believe. Yes. Okay. Thank you very much uh, for the introduction. Uh, and uh, I'm Kariani, as, as uh, already presented. So I'm uh, happy to be here. Good afternoon uh, or good uh, morning to everyone, depending on the side of the world in which you are you are at the moment. Uh, I'm going to present uh, some uh, uh, some days of uh, our Piaco uh, uh, project, focusing on uh, the goal one of uh, of Piaco project, uh, which is propeller design by optimization. Uh, this is a short summary of uh, what I'm going to to say, and uh, in particular, I start with uh, some uh, a brief overview of the Piaco project as a whole. Uh, then uh, of goal one, and then I'll focus on uh, our activities at the University of Genoa. Uh, then I'll also show you some previous results uh, from other projects uh, uh, which we had, and then I'll come to some conclusions. So uh, stating something about the uh, CACO project, uh, this is the background. Uh, basically, uh, I do not want to go in all the detail because uh, uh, they have been already by, by Michael uh, a, a few minutes ago. So we all know that uh, the interest in uh, about uh, underwater data noise uh, is, uh, has increased a lot in the, in the last years. And this led to many, many different projects. Uh, one of these projects was uh, the European project uh, Aqua, and before it uh, also a project uh, which was called uh, Silent E, which I'll mention uh, later on. Uh, and in these projects, uh, we have created some tools uh, to estimate noise and also to uh, mitigate uh, the effect. This led to this last project, Life uh, Piaqua, which is the practical implementation of uh, Aqua related to the uh, reduction of impact of noise on marine tide, maritime traffic. These are the goals of uh, Piaqua project. Uh, the objective is uh, to reduce noise, of course. And the, the five goals are the practical implementation of uh, uh, reduction of noise by using improved propellers, which is the one which I'll show you uh, in more detail. Then we have uh, some of the goals which are more related to operations of ship. So uh, this uh, uh, development of a self-estimation and control uh, tool for noise on board, the inducements of virtuous approaches from ship owners to reduce shipping and their water related noise, uh, the adaptation of maritime traffic according to the real state of marine ecosystem and the presence of uh, animals in different areas, and the setup of a broadcasting service for decision making support. Uh, I'll focus only of, on uh, goal one. Uh, I give you a brief uh, overview of, uh, of our goal one. Uh, it is a demonstration on uh, two boats, uh, actually one ship and uh, one uh, and one boat, of the possibility of uh, reduce the uh, reduction of uh, of noise by means of uh, optimized uh, uh, retrofit propellers. So the keywords are this, the, the, the the ones which are here under two boats uh, optimization and uh, possibility to retrofit uh, in order to reduce uh, the underwater noise. Uh, this is the global overview. We start with uh, the numerical optimization of the propellers. Uh, we perform model tests with uh, both uh, original and optimized propeller in order to get uh, a first idea of uh, what we can do in terms of reduction. 
and then we have sea trials. Actually, we will have sea trials for sure, uh, only for the small boat, which is the one which we are considering as uh, University of Genoa, uh, while for the second, uh, it is still uh, uh, in, under discussion. So we will see uh, uh, how it will go. Then I move to our uh, activities, and in particular, these activities of uh, optimization of the small passenger boat. So this slide shows you what I mean with small passenger boat. Uh, it is a, a passenger ferry uh, in marine protected areas, actually in Portofino area, in Cinque Terre area near Genoa. Uh, the boat is uh, more or less 25 meters long uh, with a displacement in the intermediate condition, which is about 70, 65 tons, ranging from uh, 46 to 76 between light and full load. The intermediate condition, which is the one which we used for as a design condition, uh, means that we have 50% uh, consumables and 250 passengers on board, which is the most used uh, condition for this ship. These are the activities which we carried out, uh, starting from the collection of information for the ship, uh, realization of model tests, as I said, for the original propellers, optimization, and then model test again for the optimized propeller. Then in parallel, we are also carrying out uh, acoustic simulation of the original and optimized propellers. Uh, we have already manufactured the new full-scale propellers, and we plan to do uh, measurement in full scale for both original and optimized propeller, which at the moment has not been possible because of the COVID situation. Uh, today, I will focus only on uh, these three points uh, because they are already finished and uh, completed. So uh, starting from the model test for the original propellers, we carried out the tests at our cavitation tunnel, uh, testing the, the propellers. And uh, in particular, I do not want to go in uh, all the details of all the tests which we have carried out, but uh, just to say that uh, uh, we considered uh, the different loading condition, different velocities, and we have uh, uh, many data. Uh, so we have the inception speed of different cavitation conditions. We have some uh, uh, photographs and uh, characterization of specific points. As an example, this is the cavitation extent which we have at 15 knots in the intermediate condition, which is also probably the most uh, used condition for this boat, uh, at least when uh, moving from one place to, to the other. Uh, we also know that uh, this, this uh, propeller has uh, cavitation already at uh, 10 knots. So this is uh, another important issue. Uh, then uh, we have, of course, measured noise, and we have different measurement of noise at uh, the same speed with different displacement, showing uh, that uh, increase in the displacement from light yellow to heavy blue line, we have an increase of noise. And uh, at the constant displacement, when we increase velocity, at least from uh, 10 knots to 15 knots, uh, we have a rather large increase of noise, even if uh, at from 15 to 20, the uh, tends to remain uh, rather, rather constant. Then uh, we moved to uh, the optimization of the propellers, which we perform by means of uh, a parametric description of uh, the propeller using these lines and using 35 pre-designed variables in order to optimize our objectives, our quantities of interest, which are 18 design objectives, which basically are extent of cavitation on one side and efficiency on the other, which we do not want to reduce. Uh, after performing this optimization, which uh, considers a lot of, of possible solutions, more than 100,000 solutions, we select some geometries, and, uh, and then we uh, analyze these uh, geometries by means of uh, higher level uh, tools. So in the optimization tool, we use uh, uh, BEM uh, codes uh, in steady conditions, while uh, when we analyze the, the optimal solution, we use unsteady cavitating BEM calculation and uh, uh, RANS calculation in steady condition, and also uh, this uh, ETV model, which is used for the estimation of radiated noise. So we have also a direct link to the radiated noise. This is some uh, it is an example of what we obtain. We start from uh, a propeller which has a certain amount of cavitation, as you see, 
we obtain propellers with less cavitation, in particular this one here under, which has a considerable reduction in, in, cavi in cavitation. We obtain also data about the reduction of the pressure peak of the, of the spectrum, which is the one in the y-axis in this graph, in, with respect to the efficiency change. Uh, so we, we know that uh, the reduction of cavitation and uh, uh, increase of efficiency are unfortunately conflicting objectives, and this slide shows this. So this is the reference propeller. We see that in reducing noise, we have a slight reduction of, of efficiency. Uh, we, we see also that in case we want a trade-off, we can have some solution with a lower reduction, but still of, of noise, but still with the, the same efficiency of even a, a bit more. In our case, we decided to choose a, a propeller for which we had a reduction of only 0.1 knots uh, at constant power, but with a considerable reduction of, uh, of noise. Moving to uh, the results of this optimized propeller, these are the results in terms of uh, uh, cavitation extent, which is uh, considerably reduced. The vortex is much uh, less, uh, much less important. Uh, and uh, uh, we have also postponed the cavitation phenomena a lot in, uh, with, uh, with our optimization. In terms of noise, these are the two results for the most important velocities, 10 knots with uh, uh, the blue line with the original propeller and red line with the optimized with a reduction of uh, 10 dB, and the 15 knots with a reduction which is uh, more or less 15 dB, which is also in line with what we expected from the calculations uh, which I showed before. So uh, I do not want to go into detail of this slide because this is just uh, pressure, uh, pressure pulses. Uh, I show you some hints about previous results. Uh, we performed uh, similar calculations also in the Silent V project with uh, a, a propeller of a, a ferry, which was uh, run at constant RPM. In this case, the problem was related to uh, reduced pitch condition. So we needed to reduce the noise in this condition at low velocity. Uh, we performed the design, the, the, the optimized propeller is this one uh, on the right. We reduced cavitation actually in uh, correspondence to the reduced pitch condition. And we obtained that uh, the noise spectrum is more or less the same, uh, the, the picture above for the higher velocity. And is a, a, it has a reduction of uh, more or less 10 dB at reduced pitch. In correspondence to this, we had also an increase, a slight increase of efficiency in this case. So it is possible to have improvements of noise and also of efficiency in parallel. A, a similar uh, uh, data we had also in this, in this, uh, this other project, which is uh, a project which we carried out with Azimuth Benetti. So in this case, uh, the, the topic is, uh, the, the, the boat is a leisure boat, uh, and we had the reduction of cavitation, a considerable reduction of cavitation, and in parallel to this, also a reduction of noise. In this case, uh, I would say 5 to 10 dB, depending on the, on the, on the frequency. Uh, in this case, we had also C trials, while in the first case, in the case before, we added C trials. In this case, the C trials gave us the idea that the, the, the velocity of the ship had an increase of one knot. So in this case, uh, it, we had also an increase of efficiency, even if uh, we hadn't direct measurement of underwater noise, unfortunately. So this is uh, still uh, something which we need to investigate or wait for the, the, the last vessel of uh, the PIACO project. Uh, so coming to some conclusions uh, about uh, my, my, my short presentation, uh, I, I have given a, a very fast overview of PIACO project as a whole. Uh, and then I focused on uh, goal one activities. Uh, our activities have uh, shown and has uh, proven that uh, design by optimization is uh, an efficient way of uh, designing retrofit propellers with uh, lower underwater region noise. Of course, we know that uh, uh, noise reduction and efficiency increase are conflicting objectives, but we have seen that a trade off is possible. And uh, the improvements in underwater noise can range between 5 to 10 dB. Uh, 
with, uh, I would say, at least a constant efficiency. In, in case we need uh, a higher reduction of, uh, of noise, uh, we need uh, uh, to accept some reduction of efficiency, but uh, we can add a trade-off between the two, the two, the two objectives. Uh, unfortunately, we still miss C trials, complete C trials, I mean, for both efficiency and uh, uh, underwater laser noise. And uh, we hope to be able to perform them in a uh, short time because they are planned for the boat uh, I've shown in, uh, in spring. So this is what we expect. And then we, of course, uh, I say that uh, this uh, needs to be generalized uh, in order to have uh, a more general idea. And uh, we need further cases and further analysis we have uh, comforting uh, results at the moment, but we, of course, need uh, many more results in order to have a more broader and general uh, conclusion about this. So I stop here my presentation. I think, uh, I hope to have been in time, but uh, of course, uh, we, I wait for the discussion later on. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Michele. Our next presentation is by Stian Andreasen and Oystein Petterson of the Ship Classification Society, DNV. Uh, Stian is DNV's Global Head of Practice for Noise and Vibration, and Oystein is an engineer in the Noise and Vibration Unit. They'll be speaking about DNV's quiet ship notation and about the first issuance of the notation to a large commercial vessel. So please welcome Stian and Oystein. Thank you, Michael. Can you hear us clear? Uh, Einstein, if you could uh, share the presentation. Yeah, there we have it. Thank you and uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, good night for everyone, depending on where you are in the world. We are two presenters on this uh, presentation from DNV. It's uh, myself for <coughs> heading the noise and vibration unit in DNV Oslo. And it's uh, Einstein Petersen who will take the technical part uh, in the uh, end of the presentation. And he is the, say, the technical expert on, uh, on underwater noise. So if you take the next slide, uh, Einstein. I will give a short background just in uh, to explain uh, about the silent notation and how this was developed back in the uh, earlier days, uh, because uh, DNV was actually contacted by uh, a Norwegian oil major back in 2006 and 2007, where they had problems with communication from the oil platforms to down to the to the subsea equipment. And they asked DNV whether we could come up with a set of requirements for ships to avoid disturbance between the, uh, uh, or the communication disturbance that happened between the platforms and the sub, uh, subsea equipment. Uh, and then we started to develop uh, the silent notation. We started to do some research on, uh, on uh, underwater noise emissions from ships. Next slide, Einstein. Uh, and we started then to develop the class notation and it was uh, issued in 2010 as the, the first classification society who actually published a notation on underwater noise. Um, when we developed the notation, we thought uh, about different ship types and different operational performance of, uh, of the different ships. Uh, and also, of course, one of the aims should be to develop criteria for different operational performances. And as you see from, uh, from the slide now, the silent notation is divided into five different sub notations. It's four notations that are based on vessel performance during different operations. It's uh, different requirements uh, depending on the operation of the, of the different vessel types. And there is one uh, notation who is uh, more uh, into the environmental impact side of underwater noise emissions. That is the silent E. 
And you can say that when we started the development and when we first issued this uh, notation, it was mainly other vessel types. It was the specific vessel types with specific operations that applied for the notation, like fishery vessels. It's a lot of research vessels, of course, and seismic and acoustic vessels. But recently, the last uh, two, three, four years, the main, uh, the major type of notation that have been issued is the silent E related to the environmental impact of, um, of underwater noise emissions. Uh, and this notation is divided into two different uh, set of requirements. It's, um, it, it's a transit condition, which of course is, uh, is uh, representing the at the least strict requirements. And it's also included a, not, uh, a condition which is more on the quiet mode. And that means if uh, vessels are, for example, uh, slowing down in, in specific areas or uh, to, to reduce the noise levels for either in particular areas or in harbors and so on. I think that was the uh, short background I stand, so maybe you can uh, continue on the rest. Yes, <clears throat> thank you. Yeah, so as uh, Stian mentioned, we, uh, we see uh, that the quiet chip notations are becoming more and more common, especially the silent E for, uh, for cruise vessels, but we also see a lot of uh, fishing vessels and also research vessels uh, having interest in uh, silent F and silent R respectively. Uh, but so far, larger commercial vessels have, to a large extent, been excluded. This is, uh, among other things, due to uh, their higher noise levels and that they might not be able to comply with uh, the uh, noise limits that are available today. Or the stakeholders might not be aware of the uh, issues related to underwater noise, or they do not believe that they will uh, comply with today's limits. Additionally, uh, the uh, measurement procedures for underwater noise are to a large extent uh, a bit cumbersome for larger vessels, meaning that they require uh, quite a lot of uh, dedicated vessel time. So this might uh, mean that there is a need for a simplification. Uh, but uh, at the same time, we see now that there is a, uh, an increased interest from stakeholders within this uh, segment. And uh, there is definitely a large potential within, within the segment. Research also shows that, uh, that the 10% uh, of the worst performers of uh, ships today contribute to the majority of the water noise. So if you are able to quiet the, uh, the worst performers, we are able to do quite a significant impact. Uh, and we have also included this uh, picture to the right, showing um, parts of the world fleet sailing today. So uh, looking at this picture, we have asked ourselves, uh, how can we be able to benchmark a large number of uh, vessels? So then we come to the uh, verification measurements. Uh, the NV7 class today allows uh, three different measurement methodologies. The most uh, common one used today is the ISO 17208 which use uh, three hanging hydrophones. Uh, we also allow uh, the DNA's shallow water method utilizing a single bottom mounted hydrophone. Uh, and in addition, we uh, allow a simplified measurement methodology with um, uh, or for ships that have resiliently mounted engines and diesel electric propulsion system, where we can do the measurements on board the ship using near field pressure pulse measurements. So going back to the merchant vessels, they usually have two dominating noise sources. They are the uh, uh, large two-stroke engines, which are rigidly mounted, and we also have the propeller. We often see that the engines uh, act as a noise floor for the low power conditions, while the propeller is the dominating noise source when it is uh, operating beyond its cavitation inception point. So this means that we are able to reduce the machinery noise. This will, to a large extent, reduce the underwater radiated noise at low power conditions, while reducing cavitation noise will reduce urine at higher power conditions. 
So here we have included a few uh, rules of thumb when it comes to um, reducing measures uh, or underwater noise reducing measures on merchant ships or ships in general. So on the propeller side, it's uh, uh, it can be a good idea to um, increase uh, the propeller diameter and or the number of blades to reduce the propeller load. And we can also do some tip offloading. But uh, when we do these measures, it's also important to keep the uh, the efficiency in mind. Uh, in addition, we can uh, improve the wake flow, uh, no wake field and uh, inflow. And uh, on the machinery side, the most common uh, common noise reducing measure is to do resiliently uh, uh, mounting of machinery and other noisy equipment. But this is not uh, always possible for uh, large two-stroke engines, or it's not possible. Um, in addition to this, uh, some investigations are currently uh, uh, going on into the field of the air bubbles, which uh, I think we will get back to later in this webinar. So on, on propeller strength, DNB has uh, recently released a uh, revised uh, class rules and guidelines that allows for more flexibility uh, for um, calculations of the structural integrity of uh, ship propellers. And this was used for the design of the uh, Onyx piece propeller. So to the right here, we can see the, the Onyx piece. This is the first merchant vessel that has been awarded the uh, DMV sign of E notation. It was built by Hyundai Samo and it was delivered uh, last year. It's an FMX tanker and uh, its main noise sources are the two stroke engine and also the propeller. And here we have a quick uh, case introduction. Uh, the uh, certification process of the underwater noise emissions was part of a JDP between uh, DNB, Dai Heavy Industries, and Korea Research Institute of Ships and Ocean Engineering. Uh, the propeller was not designed only with the uh, underwater noise reduction in mind, uh, but it was uh, a combination of, uh, of more factors. As uh, earlier mentioned, we, uh, we might expect to, to have some propulsive uh, or a decrease in propulsive efficiency if we only design for reduction of URM. But uh, if, we keep, uh, if we keep more factors in mind, we are able to achieve um, a compromise. So for the uh, Onyx piece, the propeller was designed using state-of-the-art CFD technology uh, to obtain a good propulsive efficiency at the same time as we have an acceptable level of cavitation. So it was, uh, it was not uh, designed only to reduce the uh, URN. So to summarize, uh, for the Onyx piece, it followed the new strength assessment guideline and load analysis by CFD. And uh, maybe the most important factor was the large diameter of the propeller. Uh, and also the consequent uh, low RPM. Uh, the propeller was also lightly loaded uh, and it had the uh, thinner propeller blades. In addition to this, the uh, weight was optimized and it's a combination of the hull lines and a free swirl duct. So uh, we can say that the Onyx piece found the sweet spot between efficiency and uh, noise emissions. Yes. Thank you. Okay, thank you. I think that was the end of our presentation. Yes, uh, well, thank you, Stan, and thank you, Einstein. Um, our uh, next presentation is by Johan Boschers. Johan is senior researcher at the Maritime Research Institute Netherlands and research lead of the EU Saturn project. He'll be speaking about the development within the Saturn project of technical solutions to mitigate ship noise. So please welcome Johan Boschers. So thank you, Michael. Yes, uh, good day to you all. Um, yeah, the next 15 minutes, you will get some information on the EU project Saturn that started last year, and more specifically on the technical solutions that will be investigated to reduce the sound source level of the ship. As the project that was only recently started, I cannot show you 
any concrete results yet, but you will get an outline of the, of the project. Um, the effects of sound on marine life depends upon distance, frequency, and of course, uh, the source level. And the effects may vary from physical and physiological effects to behavioral response and masking. In the review by Duarte et al, it was shown that uh, ship noise, which mainly is concerned with behavioral response and masking of marine life, as in 95% of the papers have shown a significant effect of noise, most notably, let's say, on marine mammals, fish, and uh, invertebrates. This was recognized by the EU, and the EU has therefore included the underwater radiated noise in its definitions of the good environmental status in 2008. In descriptor 11, it is stated that underwater noise should be at levels that do not adversely affect the marine environment. <coughs> this has led, let's say, to a large number of noise measurement programs in the EU waters in order to monitor the ambient noise and the, and the noise from, from shipping. These are the Bias Project in the Baltic Sea, Yomopans in the North Sea, Jonas in the Atlantic, and Quiet Met in the Mediterranean. In the EU action plan towards zero pollution that was uh, released uh, last year, it was stated that the Marine Strategy Framework Directive should be reviewed by 2023, and that work should be done on defining EU threshold values for the maximum level of underwater noise stemming from maritime transport, construction, and dredging. However, defining these threshold values still asks for quite a number of research questions to, to be answered. On the biolog biological side, it is what are the critical noise levels, and these are rather difficult to determine, especially, let's say, when masking and behavioral responses is concerned. What are achieve achievable source levels uh, for the ship, given uh, that are still practical and economically feasible? And also, how should we accurately measure the ship source levels in, in shallow water, for, which is mostly relevant for very large vessels in European waters when these ships come into operation? The second project aims to investigate these topics and to come up, let's say, with conclusions. Um, the project has started in February last year. It takes four years. Coordinator is Gary Sutton of University College of Cork, who will join us as panelists in, in the discussion. And it has 20 partners consisting of biologists at several universities, acoustic as experts, and marine engineers and naval architects. Um, the review of the set and work package, um, next to the coordination and dissemination in work package two, that's led by IASCO, um, uh, underwater noise measurement standard will be developed for shallow water in close cooperation with the ISO working group active on, on that area. Um, for that purpose in the working group, in that work package, also full-scale noise measurements will be performed in deep water and in, in shallow water, and the measurement uncertainties will be quantified. In work package three, the marine biologists will measure the dose response curves for marine mammals, fish, and invertebrates, and they will determine the marine life noise uh, exposure budgets. In work package four, different technical solutions to reduce the ship source levels will be uh, an, an analyzed, and these will be discussed in the following sheets. And finally, in work package six, um, will, will among others perform an upgrade of the marine spatial planning tool and make impact uh, assessments, as well as noise policy case studies and evaluation of noise mitigation scenarios. Um, shipping industry is, however, currently change, uh, challenge, as, as a major challenge in the sense that the greenhouse gas emissions should be uh, reduced. The IMO targets a 50% reduction in 2050 compared to 2008, but other organizations, also including the EU, have, have much more an, an, an ambitions. Uh, and this has led to the introduction of the energy efficiency index for both new ships and for uh, existing ships as well as the carbon intensity indicator, the CII. Whereas the EEXI and EEDI are concerned with how ships are equipped or designed, the CII is related to the carbon and emissions of the ship's operation over the course of a year. So it's more related with the operation rather than, let's say, than design of the ships. Now, the question that naturally arises is, can we optimize ships for these reduced greenhouse gas emissions and underwater radiated noise? Um, let's first have a, have a look at the ship, 
um, source levels for, for underwater radiated noise, there we see at low ship speed that the noise is uh, coming from the noise of the main propulsor engine and for the auxiliary machinery. But at high ship speeds, such as the ship design speed, it is cavitation noise that is, is dominating. Um, this movie shows, an, uh, shows cavitation on the, on, on the propeller of a bill carrier. Cavitation on the propeller uh, usually happens when the propeller enters the wake peak where the loading is much higher. When pressure, pressure drops below vapor pressure, water evaporates and it becomes uh, a cavity. When the blade moves out of the, the wake peak, the cavity collapses again, and this is responsible for the underwater radiated noise of the, uh, of the propeller. Um, it has already been discussed before that there is a trade-off between efficiency and noise, and it's nicely shown here. It is an example of an automatic propeller uh, design study involving thousands of computations. Um, we see that uh, the last generation, so the generation that gives us the best performance, with respect to both efficiency and cavitation inception is shown over here. Um, the horizontal axis shows the cavitation inception margin. So it's, 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 it's a measure for the, for the cavitation uh, nuisance. And we see that if we want to increase the propeller efficiency shown on the horizontal axis, that the cavitation margin reduces and that below a certain, above a certain uh, efficiency, that uh, we always have cavitation on the, on the propeller. And it is this trade-off between cavitation and efficiency that is usually uh, bothering us. Um, now, with these modern de design uh, methods, we also see, let's say, that the, the propellers that are uh, designed over here, they show an improvement with respect to the reference propeller. So yes, we can definitely make improvements in both efficiency and noise with respect to uh, uh, current pro propellers using the, the most modern propeller design tools. But in the end, there's always a trade-off between efficiency and noise. And what are possible win-win uh, uh, situations with respect to greenhouse gases and underwater radiated noise? First of all, these are electric propulsion systems, for instance, battery-powered uh, ferries, especially for small vessels that may be interesting to reduce the machinery noise. Wind propulsion is also uh, getting more and more, and more popular. Um, this leads to an unloading of the propeller, therefore cavitation may be reduced, but at present we do not know if phase side cavitation is occurring. That is also topic of research within an, an, an other projects. Air bubbles and layers have also been are also more and more applied on ships in order to reduce the frictional uh, resistance. <coughs> But it is also known from, from literature that there are naval vessels, naval vessels have been equipped with air bubble layers in order to mitigate the noise coming from the machinery room. However, as these are military vessels, such data is not publicly, uh, has not been publicly, <coughs> has not been published. Um, speed reduction has also often been reduced. If when cavitation is present on the propeller, the source level will definitely be reduced if you apply a speed reduction, if there's a fixed pitch propeller, of course. But we should also keep in mind that if speed is reduced, the vessel remains longer in a certain area, and it is therefore the sound exposure level that needs to be analyzed in order to analyze the consequences for marine life. Finally, alternative propulsors should also be investigated as as our design methods are uh, getting better and better, and this, these may have maybe alternatives with respect to the open propeller. In Saturn, there will three technical solutions will, will be um, investigated. The first one is a pump jet by CNR and Setena. Uh, so a pump jet consists of an, uh, actually of a propeller combined with stator blades to take out uh, the swirl in order to improve the further improve the efficiency surrounded by a duct, duct, which leads to an increased tip loading of the, of the propeller. The Val Group will evaluate a trochoidal propulsor that was recently developed in, in France and that has shown a very high uh, efficiency. And within the Saturn project, the Val Group will e evaluate the trochoidal pro propulsor with respect to the underwater radiated noise. Both uh, alternative propulsors will be evaluated for a twin screw ferry 
for which the hull geometry has currently been provided by BC Ferries. Um, but the evaluation will only be performed using model tests. Finally, the injection of air bubbles will be investigated by, uh, by Marin. Two cases will be considered. The first one is analyzing the consequences of these mask belts. So a bubble curtain surrounding the ship hull in order to mitigate uh, machinery noise. The other one is the injection of bubbles into the propeller disc in order to soften the cavity collapse. The softening of the cavity collapse has already been investigated by English in the 1980s in a cavitation tunnel. So through a pipe, the uh, air was injected into uh, especially the tip vortex cavity and uh, the, the results were analyzed with respect to the, the hull pressure fluctuations measured uh, directly above the hull. And, and here we see the results on the horizontal axis is the frequency made non-dimensional with the blade passage frequency so the first blade pass frequency is in the order of 10 Hertz for a typical full-scale vessel. And we see that if air is injected into the cavity, we see a significant reduction of the hill pressure fluctuations at the higher frequencies, but at the blade passage frequency and its second harmonic, we hardly see it in a change in, in the hill pressures. These results were also confirmed by Rolls-Royce as it was named at, at that time in the EU's sonic project, air bubbles were injected into the propeller disc from a, uh, through a ring mounted upstream of the, of the propellers. And we see that with increasing air supply, the high frequency noise is significantly reduced. But for this situation, we see that the noise at the blade passage frequency is actually increasing. Um, at Mara, we intend to evaluate, let's say, this. Uh, the injection of, of air bubbles also using a uh, uh, well a similar construction as this one but, but somewhat more, more more simpler and not for the whole propeller disc but then for this merchant type vessel. Sound isolation using air bubbles as said before for military vessels there is no uh, not much data no data available in open literature but data has been published on mitigation of pile driving noise which you see an example over here taken from a paper by, by Bellman. We see the insertion loss by a bubble screen, and we see that the bubble screen is most effective at the frequency of one kilohertz, where we have an insertion loss um, of, of 25 decibels. At low frequencies, the bubble screen is less effective, but at the frequency of about 100 hertz, we still see that we can reduce our noise levels by five to 10 dB. Um. At Marin, we have already performed some first tests in order, let's say, to uh, analyze how a bubble screen can be uh, generated around the ship hull. It's done through a porous, uh, <coughs> porous hose. So we see that we can generate bubble screens around the, the ship hull. In order to evaluate the uh, insertion loss, so the effect on the radiated noise, the center section of the ship hull will be made of steel. We will excite this steel uh, ship hull with a shaker and then measure the underwater radiated noise with and without the bubbles present. We've also seen in the, in the movie that the bubbles were injected into the propeller disc. Uh, the consequences for the propeller performance has been measured. We have measured a thrust reduction by 4%, but torque was actually also reduced. And in total, we see an efficiency reduction by 1% due to the injection, due to the uh, convection of the air bubbles into the propeller disc. So a quick review then of the task description in work package four. Basically, it consists of three parts. The first one is overall improvement of the, the knowledge, design tools, and the design evaluation tools. So both numerical tools and, and, and experiments that will be performed in, in model basins. Then the design and evaluation of the technical solutions, all performed with, with skill uh, models. And then finally, a critical analysis of the costs and benefits of the technical solutions and review of the other solutions. So the dose response curves developed by the biologists will, will be used. We will also look into the speed dependency of the, of the cavitation noise and also the consequences on the EEDI and EEXI and CII will, will be analyzed. That uh, concludes my, my presentation. 
Um, here you see a review of the Saturn deliverables with the technology readiness level, of which you will certainly hear more in the coming years. Uh, I'm not going through them in detail due to a lack of time, but I thank you for your attention and I look forward to the discussion. Great, thank you, Johan. Uh, our final presentation today is by Matthew Cook. Uh, Matthew is a research engineer at Transport Canada's Innovation Center and is a project officer managing many of the center's R&D efforts to reduce underwater noise. Uh, Matthew will give an overview of some of those efforts in his presentation. Please welcome Matthew Cook. There we go. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm uh, Matthew Cook, and I'm a project officer, uh, like Michael mentioned, at Transport Canada's Innovation Center. And today, I'll be discussing some of the work that we do and also some of the projects that we funded. Uh, so the Innovation Center is an engineering and science research group within Transport Canada. And we support research, development, and demonstration projects that enhance uh, the safety, security, efficiency, and environmental performance of Canada's transportation system. And specifically, I work in the marine uh, RD&D team. And we're a multidisciplinary team comprised of engineers, policy analysts, uh, naval architects, and marine biologists. And we have three main focuses, uh, or three key areas, that we look at in our research projects. Um, and that is, uh, we look at reducing greenhouse gas emissions in the marine sector, uh, which we call Clean Marine. Uh, we also have Marine Mammal Protection and the Quiet Vessel Initiative. Um, so underwater vessel noise is a major concern for us, uh, especially for the Quiet Vessel Initiative, which is what I'll be focusing on today. Um, and as many of you may know, underwater noise uh, produced by ships can neg negatively impact uh, marine life. And we're particularly concerned about the effects on endangered marine mammals. Um, so underwater noise uh, that's generated by ships can affect marine mammals in a few different ways, uh, including masking their communications. Um, it can also uh, change their behavior, such as causing them to flee important habitat or changing their uh, foraging habits. Um, and it can also cause physiological stress, uh, which can negatively impact their health. So Transport Canada is acting and we're building on the Government of Canada wide oceans protection plan to enhance the protection of Canada's endangered whales. And when I talk about uh, endangered whales, at least for Canada, uh, we're referring to the North Atlantic right whale on Canada's east coast, uh, the Southern resident killer whale on Canada's west coast and the St. Lawrence estuary beluga, uh, which is in the St. Lawrence estuary. Um, so as I mentioned, I'll be focusing on the Quiet Vessel Initiative, and uh, this is a Transport Canada-led initiative that's advancing research into the development and deployment uh, of Quiet Vessel designs, retrofits, and operational practices. And this is also part of uh, the Trans Mountain Expansion Project's accommodation measures to address concerns of Indigenous groups about the impact of underwater vessel noise. So as part of the Quiet Vessel Initiative, we're testing different technologies and operational practices that have the potential to reduce underwater noise from ships and therefore reduce the impact on marine mammals. Um, and as part of this initiative, we do have funding available and it's available to Indigenous groups, industry and academia. And funding can uh, take the form of a few different uh, or has a few different forms, including formal contracts with the Government of Canada and also through grants and contributions. Um, so here uh, is a quick overview of some of our uh, past, current, and future funding opportunities related to the Quiet Vessel Initiative. Um, so for contracts, we're planning another uh, call for proposals, which will hopefully come out this winter. And the requirements are still being developed, but we're mostly looking at um, receiving proposals for projects that will test and evaluate underwater rated noise mitigating technologies for ships. Uh, we're also looking at standardization of methods to measure the effectiveness of underwater noise reducing technologies so that we can validate these uh, things that we're testing. Um, we're also interested in on onboard noise monitoring systems and developing guidelines to assist vessel owners or operators to develop noise management plans. Um, we also previously had a call for proposals uh, for contribution funding, which ended in June. 
and we've received lots of proposals and we're hoping to announce those soon. Um, and we currently have a call for proposals that's open at the moment uh, to eligible Indigenous groups along the TMX Marine Shipping Route. Um, and this call for proposals closes on February 2nd. Um, and just note if any of you are interested in being notified of future funding opportunities or if you have any questions about the current funding opportunities, um, I encourage you to email us and I will be providing you with our contact information uh, near the end of the presentation. Uh, we had a previous call for proposals for contracts uh, related to the Quiet Vessel Initiative and uh, we received lots of different responses and we awarded 11 different contracts and uh, these are all of them, uh, but for example, uh, some of them look at testing cavitation monitoring systems, um, evaluating hull coatings, and even testing to support the development of international standards. Uh, so next, I'll be talking about some of these projects and other projects that we've done in the past. Um, so we commissioned a report that uh, provides a brief background of underwater radiated noise. And it also includes a matrix or a table of mature and near commercial technologies that have the potential to reduce underwater vessel noise. And these technologies were evaluated based on their applicability, cost, benefits, and noise reduction potential. So if you're a ship owner or operator looking for underwater, noise, uh, underwater radiated noise reducing technologies that are applicable to your vessel, uh, this report may be of use to you. And if you're interested in uh, accessing it, uh, you can scan the QR code on the, the left-hand one, um, and that will take you directly to the report. Uh, but also if you're not able to access a QR code on your phone, um, I will have a link to our website that hosts all these reports later on. Um, we've also uh, supported development of uh, international standards at the ISO for the measurements of um, vessel source levels in shallow water. Uh, so there currently are uh, standards at the ISO for measuring vessel source levels, but they're more for deep water. And that's not always convenient or available in areas where researchers may be looking to collect data. Um, so this project is investigating different procedures and combinations of sensors uh, to measure vessel source levels in shallow water. And they'll also be uh, comparing their measurements to measurements that were taken using the current ISO standard to see what the differences are. Um, and there's a white paper available on our website, uh, which you can also access through the QR code on screen or uh, through our website, which I'll provide a link to later. Uh, similar to other presenters, we have done some work on uh, designing quieter propellers um, that can reduce underwater noise. So cavitation is a huge contributor to underwater noise coming from propellers. Um, and this study looked at uh, doing numerical evaluations uh, on various propeller parameters to design a quieter propeller. And they also looked at the relationship between efficiency and underwater uh, noise. So the uh, outcomes from this report um, included a recommendation for a quiet propeller. And they also found, uh, similar to what we've heard today, that in general, optimizing for reduced noise can come at the cost of reduced efficiency. And uh, we're really interested about this relationship, so we have been continuing research uh, with our partners uh, to advance this work. Um, as I mentioned, we've also done some projects on real-time shipboard cavitation monitoring projects. Um, this is an example of one of them. And uh, so this project in particular involved the installation of sensors on the hull uh, around or near the area of the propeller. And data from these sensors were used to determine whether the vessel was cavitating or not. Uh, so once our project partner had uh, refined their algorithm that could identify when the ship was and wasn't cavitating, they were actually able to roll out these uh, uh, status updates to the bridge so that the crew of the vessel could uh, potentially change how they're operating the vessel in uh, sensitive areas, such as critical, critical habitat of uh, marine mammals um, as they would be notified, you know, when they're cavitating, when they're not cavitating or when the uh, algorithm wasn't quite sure. Um, there's also another study which is led by the Port of Vancouver's ECHO program that looks at correlations between um, uh, vessels operational and design characteristics and the vessels underwater rated noise. 
So this study, um, uh, Transpo Canada contributes to it through our underwater listening station, which is located on the west coast of Canada. And we have an under this underwater listening station collects really high quality underwater noise recordings. And data from the station was used as part of the study um, to look at these statistical correlations between the vessel's characteristics and its underwater noise levels. Uh, so this project is ongoing, but we have had a few um, phases complete already. And they found that uh, for design characteristics, its uh, vessel length had the strongest correlation with increased underwater noise. And for operational characteristics, speed through water and draft had the strongest correlation with underwater noise. Um, they're continuing this work by developing a statistical model that can predict a vessel's underwater noise uh, using nine design and operational characteristics. And they're currently working to validate this model against other ship noise databases. Um, so uh, at least for the last project, uh, you can access those reports through the Vancouver Fraser Port Authority's website, uh, but all of our other projects, uh, if you weren't able to access them through the QR codes on stream, you are able to access them on our website uh, that hosts all our reports called the Open Science Portal. Um, so you can scan it and open the link with the QR code or with the link on screen now. Uh, and this is my contact information. And as I mentioned, if you have any questions about uh, finding these reports or to be added to our distribution list for funding opportunities, or if you want to learn more about our current funding opportunities, uh, please contact us at the email at the bottom of this slide, and we'll be sure to get back to you. I'd also like to acknowledge uh, a few of our partners. Uh, so Krista Trounce, who's actually here today and will be taking part in the discussion panel. Um, and also uh, Dave Haney from JASCO, who won't be here today, but uh, helped out. Uh, so thank you. Thanks, Matthew, and uh, thank you to everyone for uh, a group of, of excellent presentations. Um, questions have started to come in, uh, which is great, and I'll, I'll point out that um, uh, many of the questions have already been answered by one or more of our panelists. Uh, some of those answers have generated further responses. You can see uh, all of those answered questions with their responses just by toggling over to the answered column in that, in that Q&A window. Um, before uh, we begin discussion, I just want to remind everyone to submit your questions via the Q&A feature at the bottom of the screen. And uh, please, uh, to direct your question to one or more of the panelists, if you do have somebody in particular in mind, or to the panel as a whole. Um, Amelie, I wonder if you could get the slide up uh, showing again the names of the panelists. And uh, while we're waiting for that, um, thanks, Emily. Uh, I want to say that we're, we're happy to be joined in this discussion by three additional experts associated with uh, some of the projects you've just heard about. Uh, we have with us now Hyung Suk Lee, a uh, senior researcher at the Hyundai Maritime Research Institute in South Korea, uh, who is involved in the design of the Onyx piece. Uh, Jerry Sutton, a senior research fellow at University College Cork and lead on the EU Saturn project and Krista Trounce, research manager at the Port of Vancouver's ECHO program, who is uh, leading or co-leading on a number of the projects uh, sponsored by Transport Canada. So uh, welcome all. Uh, panelists, uh, if you could turn on your video now. Great, I see folks' faces. So um, let's, Let's begin, and, and of course, while we're talking, um, uh, attendees, please uh, keep, keep the questions coming and we'll, we'll collate them and, and, uh, and, and use them for discussion. Uh, I'd like to just get the ball rolling, though, uh, with, a, with a general question for the group. Uh, so we've just seen presentations about a number of approaches to reducing underwater noise, uh, including some like uh, propeller optimization that are presently being applied and a variety of more novel approaches that are being adapted from other sectors or are in other stages of development. Uh, as yet, however, uh, and as I think Stin uh, or Oystein uh, had mentioned, 
only a small number of large commercial vessels have received quiet ship notations or have been designed with underwater quieting in mind. As the IMO comes to consider next steps for underwater noise reduction, what would you say is the principal impediment to uptake by industry of ship quieting at the design phase? And how might that impediment be overcome? Uh, who would like to go first? I can, <clears throat> I can say some words from, from the NV. I think, um, I think um, that it's, uh, as we see it, at least it's um, uh, the interest of uh, underwater noise reduction is uh, probably driven very much by the incentives, uh, like incentive from the port of Vancouver with the economic incentive on reducing harbor fees are, are a good incentive for actually the commercial interest in reducing the underwater noise. And uh, gu uh, guidelines from IMO is, is also very, very good in this respect. And I think it's important to, <clears throat> to mention, as we have probably seen through these, um, these presentations today, that it's, it's not necessarily one or another uh, specific device, a specific optimization that is, uh, is uh, having a very good effect. I mean, a propeller can be good and it can be bad, both on greenhouse gas reduction and on, uh, on underwater noise. And sometimes it uh, re reducing underwater noise goes hand in hand with, uh, with uh, greenhouse gas emissions and efficiency of propellers, sometimes not. So, uh, but, but to concretize the, say, the emissions, then it's probably uh, necessary to... Um, also be able to measure a large part of the, uh, of the existing commercial fleet uh, to, to actually measure the underwater noise reduction or the underwater noise emissions from the vessels uh, because it's not purely the devices installed on the ships that are actually causing any uh, or causing the reduction itself. Thanks, Dan. I'm interested in uh, other thoughts on this on this subject, uh, this what well, you th consider to be the biggest impediment uh, to uptake by industry and, and how to overcome it. If I may also add uh, to this, I think what we also see is that current class societies, they if their uh, noise with their, their rules with respect to the underwater radiated noise, mostly dedicated to specific ship types. Uh, such as fishery research vessels and for commercial vessels, it's especially these cruise ships. But for instance, for ships that are sailing at much smaller speeds than cruise vessels, it's not clear, at least not to me, how to interpret the class rules or how these class rules uh, apply. Uh, perhaps Stian can, can comment on that. Yes, I can comment upon that. I, I was maybe not uh, telling it clearly in the, in the presentation, but when we you know, when we develop the class notation of, uh, say, the silent E notation, uh, the, the basis for that was to, to uh, I mean, vessels uh, emitting noise levels above those uh, limits are probably uh, on the reverse side, while the vessels that are emitting uh, noise levels below the limits are, uh, are, are better than the average. And, and when we developed uh, that notation, it was, I mean, we, we had in our files uh, data from cruise ships. So of course that is, is based on, on the cruise ships, but uh, we also see now that uh, uh, by this own next piece that it's actually, it seemed to be a quite uh, okay requirement also for commercial vessels, but there might be other vessel types, like for example, container ships, that will, uh, we will have uh, more struggle to meet those limits. So maybe those should be tuned uh, a little bit better to the actual ship types. That's, uh, I think that's a good uh, pinpoint from you, uh, Johan. Uh, this is Johan Sop, and uh, I have experience of uh, ONXPS cases, to which award the ONXPS has, you know, uh, in notation from the DMB. 
But in my opinion, you know, the required level of URL commentary stipulated by each classification of societies are too strict for some commercial types of vessels. Uh, Stan mentioned about the container carriers or high speed and high road uh, vessels are, it is very uh, uh, too strict to achieve uh, notations without sacrificing proportion performance. So it may conflict with uh, greenhouse gas emissions. So uh, in my opinion, uh, the, at first, you know, accurate identification of current noise level by various ship types is needed to be proceeded. And then uh, I think the appropriate uh, standards for uh, notations to be reset. And in addition, it is necessary to develop technology for optimizing uh, route specific URN optimizing operation conditions through uh, the development of technology that uh, monitoring URN level in real time not measurement, only measurement. It is it's a real time uh, monitoring system is required. I think using uh, we call inward measurement, like the close measurement and methodology through the hydropon installation of her bottom, uh, which are top side of propellers or whatever, it is instead of very expensive and difficult if existing ISO standard uh, popular measurement technology is the one uh, realistic example, I think. That's all. Thanks, I, Young Sook. I, I think Krista has her hand up. Hi, uh, thanks, Michael, for that question. Um, I think one of the key impediments right now is, is that there are a lot of requirements around greenhouse gases that have been placed on um, the shipping industry. Right now, there are no requirements uh, with related to underwater noise. So the, our understanding from working with our various partners is that, you know, the, the impetus is really on uh, greenhouse gas emissions efficiency and, and pushing towards meeting things that are requirements rather than uh, the underwater radi radiated noise, which is more of a, you know, it, it's altruistic, it's, it's helpful, it's good for the environment, but it's not necessarily where um, companies can be placing their financial and, and personnel resources right now. Um, with regards to the conversation about um, quiet ship notations, we are leading a project uh, it's a three-year project hoping to, to finish off in 2023, where we're um, working together with the Ship Classification Societies and the International Association of Classification Societies um, on uh, improved alignment of, of those quiet notations, as well as um, the potential, as, as was mentioned earlier, the potential for looking at different levels. DNV is, you know, is, is great at having these different levels of their quiet notations, but even, um, you know, their silent E may not be achievable by a large container ship. Um, so in our conversations, we were talking about whether or not a, uh, a ship type specific notation would be uh, a potential way to go or just having different levels that a ship could achieve. So a, a quiet notation level A would mean you're very, very quiet and that could be achieved by a very few um, vessels. And like a level C could potentially be uh, achieved by a 350 meter container ship. So just to kind of provide some uh, additional um, context and information to that. That work is ongoing and um, results will hopefully be coming up in the next uh, about year and a half, two years. Thanks, Krista. And, and I think your, your point about uh, certain uh, types of measures uh, getting, getting priority because they're mandatory rather than voluntary uh, is, is one that's, that's borne out by an industry study uh, that was uh, commissioned by the government of Canada a few years ago. Uh, 
Michele, do you, I think you had your hand up. Do you still want to speak? Yes, yes, I had my hand up, but uh, actually uh, most of the conclusion and the discussion uh, said by, by, by Chris now uh, I, uh, are those I, I wanted to say. Uh, so I, I fully agree with uh, what uh, Chris has said. I believe, I, I really believe that uh, at the moment, uh, uh, speaking uh, with the different ship owners, the focus is really on uh, emissions, uh, gas emissions, I mean. And so they are really reluctant on uh, uh, moving on uh, other solutions which uh, seem to be in conflict with this. So this uh, is something which uh, they, they, they have in mind, uh, at least somehow. And and so this is uh, this is a, 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 a possibly one of the possible uh, blocking points at the moment. Uh, I believe that uh, other initiatives are very important, like uh, the ones uh, which you have mentioned uh, with the incentives for reduction in uh, in, in, in noise, which uh, could uh, give a, a different. Uh, uh, idea a, diff a different uh, mood to all uh, the shipping uh, society, sh shipping community I, 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 in, in a broad sense. Uh, that is uh, also why in, in our project we are focusing uh, both in parallel with uh, to the optimization of propellers on one side, but also in many different uh, ways uh, uh, of uh, operating vessels, uh, how to in, in have an impact on the operations of vessels uh, with uh, the self-estimation of noise uh, of the vessels, uh, the uh, noise mapping, continuous noise mapping, and mapping also of the presence of animals in different areas in order to know which are the areas which are more uh, subject to, to possibly to, to noise. And uh, so uh, the global broadcasting, uh, which uh, should uh, help for uh, as a decision support tool, all all the ship owners. So uh, in general, uh, a, a better understanding of the problem and uh, also solutions to improve the problem uh, in terms of operations without being too impacting on uh, on the operation. I think this is uh, very important. Thank you, Michele. Um, let's uh, move on to some of the questions that, that have been uh, coming in. And, and maybe we can start uh, with one that uh, might uh, resonate uh, a little bit with Young uh, uh point about uh, new kinds of uh, measuring noise output. Um, uh, one uh, attendee uh, expressed curiosity uh, about the a capability of, of DNV or other ship classification societies uh, to deploy portable equipment to carry out measurements for uh, their, their quiet ship notations. Um, is this done only at a yard during sea trials? Is it done, can it be done anywhere with the, with the right depth? Are there some locations globally where DNV would be able to offer the measurement? Currently, uh, another uh, attendee uh, spoke about the need to develop uh, innovative measurement techniques uh, in order to uh, make the uh, the uh, make measurement and and with it the prospect of, of notation uh, more available and and Hyung -suk, uh, you know mentioned uh, on board uh, noise output monitoring which uh, could could work within a in a feedback uh, process for for the operator uh, I'm I'd be interested in in the panel's thoughts about innovations on the measurement side that could help with, uh, with uh, uh, quiet ship notations and, uh, and, and with, with uh, design and, and quiet operation generally. Where, where do we, where are the uh, advances coming? I can start to answer from <clears throat> from DNV and, and to the concrete answer that they ask ask for. And uh, it is portable equipment that is being used when we when we measure underwater noise. And when we are doing the underwater noise measurements, we we do it worldwide with portable equipment. Uh, and it could be by uh, equipment. Uh, 
connected to a measurement station with cable. Uh, we also have equipment which are, uh, are uh, more or less autonomous that can be deployed into the, to the sea and that we collect data within a storage inside the equipment. Uh, and we also collaborate with uh, some measuring stations around the world uh, where we actually uh, can, um, we can certify the silent notation by measurements, uh, by underwater noise measurements done by these ranges that are, uh, there are one in Norway, one in Canada and so on. Do you have something to add here, Einstein? Just mentioned the uh, the uh, simplified methodology, which is uh, also allowed for um, for a restricted number of vessels for the DME seven class, where where it is assumed that the um, that it's uh, the propeller that is dominating the uh, the noise level. So we installed the sensors in the vicinity of the propeller, so we uh, or our engineers can stay on board the the vessel during the measurements and. Uh, this is a yeah, relatively simple way of doing the measurements without necessarily taking the taking the vessel out of the operations for for several hours or days. So you can say that we, we are working on uh, on trying to simplify the measurement methodologies in order to be able to uh, to not disturb the operation of the vessel or the, to or to extend the, the length of the sea trial too much. So it's possible to do the measurements within a reasonable time. And we are doing quite um, much research on, on, on this topic. Thanks, I just wanna comment on uh, innovations and, and need for innovations on the measurement side. Actually, um... Yeah, the ISO standard is very, very expensive methodology as a shipyard because it is affected by the weather condition of sea trial. And the installation is very, very dangerous job because, you know, the uh, sea trial area is very deep sea near the uh, uh, shipyard. So it is, I think, uh, of course, it is, uh, we can uh, gather in more information about, you know, general. A uh, URN, uh, uh, you know, URN data from the uh, much more the various kind of vessels. I think uh, the measurement methodology, easier measurement methodology, is to be developed, and we have to try to hard about that. Yeah, I guess I could speak quickly about it. I mean, I would do work for the Innovation Center. Um, so yeah, as I mentioned, we are interested in advancing uh, development of standards related to measurement of underwater noise because uh, you know we recognize it's an issue as well, uh, particularly the existing ISO standard. Um, as I understand it, is you know the depth requirements are quite uh, uh, you know intense and are a function of the length of the ship. So measuring large vessels can be quite difficult uh, depending on the bathymetry and you know the area where that ship is. Uh, you know, has this point of call, for example. Um, so that's why we're looking at developing uh, or advancing the development of shallow water measurements. Um, but yeah, it is a difficult issue. Not everyone can come and see or, or do passes over our underwater listing station or other stations. And um, it's something we're, we're looking to incorporate into our future calls for proposals. Thanks, and and it's it's great to see that work is is moving in, in parallel and in this area as well. Um, I'd like to turn to um, a question that I think a number of people were were interested in in having in having answered, and it was originally directed to uh, Michele, but uh, I, I think it's it's one that uh, uh, many on the on the panel might want to speak to. Um, the 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 question. Um, uh, notes a uh, point made by a few speakers that uh, at, at least at the far ends of the envelope, uh, propeller efficiency and uh, URN are, are, are sometimes in intention. Um, however, the questioner notes improvements in inflow to the propeller 
can often uh, provide a win-win simultaneously, improve efficiency and enhance noise reduction. Uh, can uh, the uh, McKelly and other members of the panel comment on the potential for underwater noise reduction from the use of inflow improvement devices like uh, upstream staters or WEDs? Uh, yes, uh, I start with this uh, last point, uh, Michael, which uh, so someone has, uh, has raised. Uh, well, um, the, there's not a, 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 a complete answer or a unique answer to them, to this, I, I, I believe. Uh, I think that uh, uh, it really depends on uh, which kind of, uh, of uh, device we, we, are, we are using uh, uh, in front of the propeller, as, as an example. Uh, so uh, in some cases, these devices uh, tends to uh, increase the loading of the propeller. Uh, just as, a, as an example, the press wheel tends to increase the loading of the propeller, uh, which can be good uh, in terms of, uh, of efficiency, but uh, uh, in terms of cavitation, probably it is not the case. Uh, in other cases, the, the devices uh, are more uh, related to a, getting a, a more uniform flow. In this case, of course, uh, if we have uh, a device which uh, provides a more uniform flow, uh, it uh, for sure it allows the, 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 the propeller designer to have uh, a, a better design, uh, exploiting better the, 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 the wake of the of a more uniform wake, and that's uh, reducing the reducing the, the, the top probably in having both the, 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 the increases of the improvements and so having the win win case. So it really depends on uh, on what we have. Unfortunately, uh, we have analyzed this uh, the different devices. Uh, uh, together with our, with uh, with some colleagues, uh, in particular uh, Stefano Gaggero, uh, who is also present in this uh, webinar at the moment, uh, but uh, uh, only in terms, mainly in terms of efficiency in this case, not in terms of underwater air noise. So I haven't a, a, a direct result in that uh, in in that direction. But I believe that uh, it is reasonable to to consider that in uh, in case we have. Uh, the devices which uh, allow to have a, a better and a uniform flow uh, flow to the propeller. Yes, we, we can have uh, both the gains. Thanks, Michele. Would anyone else like to speak with, to this question? Oh, Krista. Hi, Michael. Um, I did notice that there were a few questions uh, in the Q and A about different technologies, weight conditioning, propeller boss cap fins, things like that. Um, so at the Port of Vancouver, we uh, several years ago began incentivizing some of those uh, propeller technologies with um, not really a, a set of underwater noise benefit uh, data to go on, but more so as Michele indicated, um, these weight conditioning and these pro propeller devices uh, are intended to reduce cavitation, are intended to increase efficiency. And so we sort of, you know, take, take the leap of faith that, that those reductions in cavitation are also going to result in a, in a reduction in underwater noise. Um, that being said, you know, we have seen in our very large data set, we did try to do a couple of statistical correlations on things like a, a boss cap fin for which we have several vessels in our database who have boss cap fins. It's very common. Um, but the, you know, the potential noise benefits of some of these technologies are likely in the order of, you know, three to five decibels and the variation, even within measurement of the same vessel on repeat passes is about that same order of magnitude um, in, in the measurements that we've taken. So, you know, we would be extremely keen and I know uh, the same goes for, for Matthew and, and the others at the Innovation Center at Transport Canada, we would be extremely keen to see a before and after measurement of, of some of these technologies. So if there are opportunities um, for vessels who are going in for dry dock and intending to do some of these retrofits, largely therefore efficiency purposes, um, 
you know, I know ourselves in Transport Canada, and we have, you know, that the the listening station in um, in the waters on the approach to Vancouver, uh, where we have the capacity to to do those those pre and post measurements. Um, but but yeah, there's really understood that there is really a, a lack of data out in the public domain right now that shows quantifiably what those benefits are. And that's something we'd really like to see because I think as people, um, as ship designers, as, as owners and operators are moving towards um, higher interest in underwater noise, being able to quantify for them what those tools can do uh, would be really helpful. Thanks, Krista. And I'll note that at least uh, one questioner uh, asked specifically about boss cap fins and and what the noise reduction uh, has has been shown to be. Uh, there are uh, certainly claims by the manufacturer of reduction of noise. Uh, I think I've seen upwards of of three decibels associated with with that treatment. Uh, but but of course, uh, further further data would be would be very helpful. Um, the, the questioner noted that, that uh, uh, boss cap fans have been installed in some 3,500 ships since becoming available. And, and so uh, acquiring more, more data on that particular treatment uh, would, be, would be really helpful. I don't know if any, if any of the other panelists wanna to speak to uh, uh, available data on, on, on that treatment. Hey, Young Suk. Yeah, we have some experience. We have you know, our own, you know, PVC like you know uh, ESDS we call high pain, and we have experience about some road reduction by applying the high pain. But actually, there is some uh, uh, some you know uh, uh, many guys you know thinking about you know the high pain where the PVC apps reduce the hub voltage and it it lead to the reduction of URN, but uh, in my opinion, you know, the hub voltage is uh, less than the propeller tip voltage. The, uh, uh, the, how can the system for the reducing the URN is, I think, is a virtuous uh, cycle with the improving the performance of uh, propulsion systems like a Bristol ducts or whatever. So it, uh, if, you know, uh, we design the propeller or uh, optimizing or uh, applying the uh, energy saving devices, which leads to the suppressed cavitation inception and minimizing cavitation intensity by reducing the engine power and propeller load to achieve target speed. So this, you know, uh, various cycles are related to the redu reducing the uh, uh, underwater radiation noise of the propeller. It is just my opinion. I can also add to that, that's also our experience, that the uh, hub vortex does not contribute significantly to the underwater radiated noise when there's also sheet and tip vortex cavitation in the tip area. So basically you are, you have a possibility to improve the efficiency of your propeller. So the gain should come, let's say, from the uh, improved efficiency and slightly reduced thrust of, of your propeller. Um, another remark I'd like to make is that most of these uh, wake improvement devices, they depend very much also on the, the type of ship and the quality, let's say, of the hull geometry. And that makes it very difficult to generalize uh, the data, especially when underwater radiator noises is, is concerned, because there's indeed, let's say, a huge lack of data in, in that area. Um, very often also uh, propeller changes are, are being made. Um, because these wake improvement devices do offer you an improved propeller design, uh, and therefore you can gain uh, an, you can gain both efficiency and underwater radiated noise. But in the end, when the propeller design itself is concerned, there's always the trade-off between the two. Uh, thanks for those responses, um, and and maybe. The, those last two responses uh, lead into uh, a, a general question uh, that was posed by, by one attendee about the relationship between uh, the, the drive towards efficiency and the effect on noise. Uh, the, the question is situated uh, on EX, <coughs> EXI, uh, noting <clears throat> that EXI will apply to existing ships uh, over 400 uh, gross tons. Um, uh, 
and uh, will uh, significantly uh, affect design. Um, uh, do, does a, is a panel aware of any studies that have been carried out to estimate the effect of the EEXI regulation on global underwater noise levels? Or if you're not aware of any studies, do you have any thoughts about what the effect might be? Uh, well, this, this question is uh, related to also, I think, uh, other questions uh, uh, linked to the, uh, let's say, more general uh, idea of uh, uh, reduced velocity uh, in order to, to reduce noise. Uh, so this is a, a typical point, of course, uh, and uh, when we uh, try to compare, in, well, I, I'm not aware about a specific study about this. I can have, give you a, a general answer. Uh, of course, uh, uh, just uh, also looking at the, the results uh, which we, we had from, uh, from our study I presented today, uh, the reduction of noise is for sure uh, a, a possible important uh, way to reduce uh, uh, the reduction of speed, I mean, uh, uh, is an important way to reduce noise. We, we have seen from, uh, from our, uh, our studies that uh, uh, the same improvement which uh, we obtain with uh, uh, the propeller uh, can be obtained uh, with a, a reduction of speed uh, by, say, five knots or something like that for, for the, that boat. Of course, this is uh, related to that boat, but in general, that could be a... Uh, a, a, a broader uh, idea also for ships, and especially when we move to, to very large ships, uh, probably, uh, because in that case, the power is, uh, is, is very large. And, uh, and so the, 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 the magnitude of the problem becomes, uh, becomes, uh, becomes even larger. Uh, what I want to point out about uh, speed reduction is something that uh, it, it, it's obvious. But uh, in many cases, uh, it, uh, in, or at least in some cases, it's not, uh, uh, it is not considered. Uh, I've shown the, 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 second design I've, uh, the second design, which I've shown today, uh, was related to a control pitch propeller operated at uh, constant RPM. Uh, in that case, strange enough, uh, the level of noise was even larger at low velocity then at high velocity due to the inception of, uh, of pressure side cavitation, which is uh, much noisier than, uh, than suction side cavitation in, uh, in, some, uh, in some, uh, some, some, in some cases. So this is as something which uh, people have to keep in mind. Of course, a reduction of noise at constant pitch reduces noise. A reduction of, uh, of velocity at constant pitch reduces noise. A reduction of velocity with control beach propeller reducing uh, the pitch uh, can lead to an increase of, uh, of noise. But uh, this is a, a general uh, hint, not, uh, a, not a direct uh, answer to that. Does anyone else have, have any, any thoughts about, about this relationship? Yeah, what, what I can say is in the Saturn project, we intend, let's say, to analyze the consequences of speed reduction on the underwater radiated noise. Uh, but that's also especially for cavitation noise. So we also want to establish the cavitation inception speed. Of course, you expect, let's say, and for uh, ship owners in order to meet the EEXI that they will apply this uh, engine power limit um, in, in, in the short term. But then if you want to fully exploit that, you also let's uh, like to improve your propeller design. And by that improved propeller design, you most likely allow again, let's say for more cavitation on the propeller. Uh, such studies have not yet been performed, but they will certainly become the topic of studies, let's say in the coming years. Michelle. Yeah, I know, so not on EEXI, but Transport Canada did do a study on EEDI, um, so on the in, uh, Energy Efficiency Design Index uh, on existing vessels. So, and looking at the comparison on noise reduction kind of before and after, and happy to share that. I, I uh, unfortunately don't have the, the results at the tip of my fingers right now, but happy to share um, that report that was done, uh, I believe it was two years ago now. 
at least it gives us some some sense of of that that energy efficiency versus URN reduction um, and what that correlation is. Thanks, Michelle. That um, that factor was also included in, I think, either the first or second phase of the noise correlation study that we did, Michael, and um, no clear correlation between an EEDI, EEVI, um, and, um, and underwater noise. But just the, again, I think it's a matter of the, the variability in, in vessel source levels and, and no clear relationship was found in, in our database between, between those two. Right, thanks, Krista. And we've been talking a lot about, about uh, propeller optimization um, as, as being a, a real focus of this relationship between uh, greenhouse gas emissions and, and noise. Um, at least uh, uh, one of our presentations, uh, the one by Johan, uh, spoke about other technologies that um, uh, present more clearly a a win-win um, for for both uh, emissions and, and noise. And um, uh, there have been at least a couple questions uh, from attendees that uh, ask about some of the other technologies. Um, that, that haven't uh, been mentioned or haven't been elaborated on as yet. Uh, so for example, um, uh, one attendee uh, notes that, uh, uh, that it's good to hear that, that wind-assisted shipping will be beneficial uh, due to reduced prop load. Uh, have, uh, is anyone investigating this? Uh, Piaqua or Saturn or, or, or anyone else uh, in developing uh, wind assisted propulsion. And, and more and if you, you can answer that question or you could speak more generally to uh, other new treatments or new new propulsion systems or al alternative uh, technologies that you find particularly compelling. Yeah, I, I can state that uh, Maren was involved in an other EU proposal that recently has been approved upon and that specifically deals with wind assisted propulsion. Um, and as part of that project, we will also consider the consequences of this wind assisted propulsion on the propeller uh, performance. And then especially also on propeller cavitation and on cavitation noise. And we'll also aim, let's say, to have an, uh, well, an integrated design of ship hull and propeller in order, let's say, to make the uh, propeller operation less vulnerable to this variation in drift angles and propeller operating conditions. Um, I have to say so far, um, a few studies have been done on the effect of drift angle and wind propulsion on propeller performance. But again, this was mostly related with the propeller efficiency and not so much with propeller cavitation. But that, that will also change in, in the coming years. So that also attention will be paid to that topic. Curious to hear from the panel about um, you know other uh, propulsion systems or or novel designs that that you've found that you find particularly compelling as as a means of of reducing uh, underwater noise and and potentially uh, greenhouse gas emissions as well. Yeah, well, I already saw, let's say, the mail by the University of Strasbourg, by Patrick Ayurandi wanted to comment on that on the previous time. But they are certainly involved, let's say, in some innovative features. Um, I wanted to point out, let's say, to his use of drone to deploy a hydrophone, which is certainly a very interesting uh, concept. I think right now the measurement time is limited, but that can certainly be improved in the future. And then there are some other concepts as well that are also interesting, uh, the gated rudder and, let's say, the, the porous tip even though we think that with the tip directly designing for, tip for, for um, tip pitch reduction and tip loading reduction, maybe let's say more, um, a more simple approach, but there are definitely more uh, concepts being uh, developed uh, by other organizations. Jerry, you have your hand up. Yeah, just there were a few things that a few comments I wanted to make um, about the innovative side of things. And 
Um, I think a couple of people noticed that that rather strange propeller setup in one of the one of the diagrams that uh, Johan put up the trochoidal system. Um, I, I wish I could tell you all about that and how it worked, but it's it's new and the uh, it's very new and the uh, technology is proprietary. But what we do know is that. Yeah, it, it looks and appears to, to resemble quite closely the, the original concept from, from Voigt Schneider, and people are familiar with that. But the, we know that the uh, SME who's developed it have overcome some of the limitations associated with the Voigt Schneider, where you know that's typically applied in, in, in the situation of a high power, low speed tugs and, and the like. So the model testing that's been done with those is, has been done on very small craft and it works nicely at high speed. And um, the early indications were that it was very, very efficient, you know, sig very significant improvements in efficiency and, and a reduction in noise. And, and we're going to obviously be um, examining those, those claims in, in a lot more detail just to see how they stack up so um, in a couple of years time, we'll be in a position to, to give you some feedback and also examining um, what the, the potential is for upscaling that for application in, in larger vessels and see how that works, or, albeit um, you know, in, in silico, that's not gonna happen in, in real life. Um, that was one thing, I guess on the observation side, um, there's been a lot of, um, a lot of people putting hydrophones on, on, on different types of gliders. And uh, okay, that comes with a downside in terms of creating your own flow noise. But I think that some, some of the newest systems that I've seen, the really, really um, innovative ones have, have gotten around that. And there are certainly um, very powerful tools that, that are now being deployed for, mostly for animal tracking, it has to be said. Um, but I can see them coming in now, uh, you know, potentially as tools for use in, in uh, source level monitoring for, for other things. Um, and I suppose if we look even further out, we're starting to see fiber optic um, measure, measurement technologies coming in. So people may be familiar with those in the context of offshore oil and gas and downhole vibration measurements and that kind of thing. And also in terrestrial applications for noise and for vibration and even for temperature sensing. But I think, you know, that's a very interesting field and uh, I think it can be potentially quite disruptive. Um, you know, it may help us to get away from our reliance on these, you know, very, very expensive and tricky uh, deployments of conventional hydrophones. Thanks, Jerry. And, and I'll point out that um, among the questions and answers, uh, there's mention of a variety of, of systems, um, both the measurement side and on the, uh, the, the design side that um, you know, we, we haven't discussed. So there, there's clearly a lot of, uh, a lot of energy going into to innovation in, in the field, which is, which is great to see. Um, but does anyone else want to respond to this question uh, just about innovations that seem particularly compelling to you. Okay, I, I wanna turn to a, uh, something more of a, maybe more of a, a policy uh, question that, uh, that, that's been asked um, by a couple people. Um, one attendee wrote, are there any states that impose legally binding requirements on URN for ships, whether it's flag states, port states, or coastal states. And I think this, this may go back to, to Krista's point, which I think was echoed by Michele, that uh, there is presently a, a dearth of, of, uh, of regulation applying to, to underwater regulated noise. But does anyone know of, of any states that, that presently impose legally binding requirements? I, I can say that I, I think we are not aware of any <clears throat> any states, flag states, or governmental institutes that are 
imposing legally binding uh, criteria. We know that EU are working on some um, on some underwater noise consideration as a part of the taxonomy, but uh, that is not related, uh, according to our knowledge, at least uh, that uh, suggestion is not related to any specific uh, requirement or uh, any mandatory requirement. It's more an incentive. Yeah. Uh, you have your hand up, Michelle. Yes, the, 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 it's uh, oh, sorry, the, the, that's uh, more or less the same uh, also from my point of view. I, I, what I want, what I, I, can, I, I know is that uh, some marine protected areas are thinking about uh, uh, having some uh, mandato mandatory requirement, but uh, at the moment uh, it is only again incentives and not uh, completely mandatory but uh, they are at least thinking to make them uh, mandatory in, in future yeah I'll jump in now. thanks <laughs> um so yeah in canada we don't have mandatory requirements from a uh, vessel design perspective but we do have uh mandatory requirements in terms of some operational measures in in certain waters so for example on the west coast um, an increased approach distance during the time that we know that the southern resident killer whale uh, tend to frequent uh, Canadian waters. Um, there's also um, essentially sanctuary zones or no-go zones for vessels to create a kind of um, um, acoustic sanctuary in a sense, like a quiet space for them. So, so those are mandatory, but they're not um, they're not requirements for vessel construction. Uh, some of the work we have underway, though, that'll kind of that will help inform future decisions on that regard is we've established and, and a number of people on this call are, are part of this work um, an underwater vessel noise reduction target working group that brings together international experts to identify if we were to kind of to create a either a policy or a guideline or a requirement for vessels to reduce the noise from their fleet, what would that target be? Are we talking about, you know, a, a decibel, certain decibel reduction, um, percentage requirement reduction uh, based on different fleet, uh, types of vessels, different classes of vessels, you know, where they operate. So that uh, work is underway right now and, and is hoping to wrap up this year, at least in terms of a recommendation to the government um, for us to kind of consider what, what the next steps might be. Thanks, Michelle. Uh, Jerry? Yeah, I, 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 again, I, I, this my comment isn't directly um, related to to that question, but it's more a follow on to 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 the, to the previous comment in the sense that um, all along we're we're talking about um, reduction in in noise levels, and that's fine and it's important. And right now, it's probably all we can consider realistically. But one of the, the important aspects that perhaps, um, well, has become apparent to us through, through the gestation of the Saturn project and is, is now written into what we're, into our approach, is that um, it may be that there are parts of the spectrum that um, are more amenable to, to, to mitigation through whatever means that is, that would have a better, uh, a, a more important or more realistic or more valuable impact on on the, uh, the species present in a given area at a given time. So it's it's looking beyond simply the the level, but also where you are in the spectrum and and seeing well, okay, if we have a design optimization um, pattern or program or algorithm, can we can we figure out that perhaps that um, the, the equation where we, we get some efficiency gains um, or, or, or we may be able to optimize it in a certain part of the frequency that's giving us a bigger benefit for species that that ship would be in contact with in its normal operational sphere. So it's really taking it one more step beyond simply just noise level, but looking at, at the spectrum as well and the frequency, frequency band. Thanks, Jerry. And, and just to add to the discussion, I'll point out that uh, there's continuing work under the Marine Strategy Framework Directive in the, in the EU 
uh, also consideration of, of targets that that's happening now. Um, and, and that is a, uh, a process uh, that that is uh, uh, falls falls within within EU legislation. Um, we are coming up on two hours, uh, so we're going to have to wrap up today's webinar. There are still a lot of unanswered questions. We really thank everybody for asking a lot of great questions. Um, if your question wasn't answered, uh, the panelists may be able to respond to you directly after the webinar. And in any case, you're, you're welcome to reach out to them uh, via the emails provided in the, in the presentations and the, the link to those presentations uh, is, is in your uh, webinar invitation. I, I really wanna thank all the panelists for sharing their work with us and, and taking the time today, some from really inhospitable time zones. <laughs> thank you, Young Suk, um, to speak on this important topic. Uh, and of course, I, I want to thank uh, Transport Canada, Michelle and her team for all their work in organizing the event. Uh, Michelle, do you have any any final words? Yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks, Michael. And, and maybe I'll uh, I'll take take the opportunity here to actually, you know, speak, address a little bit. You know, there's a lot of questions in the in the in the Q&A around linkages with GHGs, with energy efficiency. And I know we've touched about it on the discussion. And, uh, you know, this is it's a very live issue for, for us as well in terms of thinking about those connections. We know that 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 is a very intense discussion happening right now at IMO, which is why we feel it is so important to to bring the issue of noise to the table as well. If there's discussions around you know, ship redesign retrofits to address issues around noise and energy, uh, sorry, energy efficiency and GHGs, how does that affect noise? And yeah, there might be something that will, um, you know, reduce noise and have no impact on GHG. That doesn't mean it's, it's not a good thing to pursue. I do, uh, you know, I agree with that. So how do we figure out the best way forward to essentially create a more sustainable uh, fleet across the globe so that we're addressing a number of issues and not increasing a problem that could affect the marine species kind of under the water while addressing kind of the air the air emission side of things so you know where where are the co-benefits how do we address all these issues together so that we're kind of moving forward in a uh, a bit more of a co cohesive way and not layering requirements you know after the fact um when when decisions are made so so kind of looking at that as a whole um, so I, I did want to, to, to thank uh, all the amazing presenters and panelists again for sharing uh, their expertise and the work with us today um, and, and everyone, all the attendees for, for their interest and participation in the discussion. As Michael said, a huge amount of questions, super interesting questions, and, and uh, it's, I think, sparked a lot of uh, thinking and thoughts as we move into discussions at, uh, at SDC next week. Special thank you to Michael uh, for co-hosting and moderating this discussion. I know it's never easy to follow the questions and try to keep things going. Um, and of course, to the partner um, NGOs for, for their help in putting this event together. I think it's pretty evident from the discussion and, and, and the, uh, the questions that are coming on that this is really, uh, there's some exciting um, research and innovation that's happening in this space and in this field. And, and we really look forward to, to kind of seeing where it goes. We really do believe that, that working together as an international community and what the international experts will help us find the innovative solutions that will ensure that our, our ocean uh, environment is sustainable for, for generations to come. So thank you, everyone. Uh, we hope you've enjoyed this event, uh, maybe learned a thing or two along the way. I know I always pick up new uh, new tidbits as, a, as I listen to these and uh, do hope to see everyone again soon, hopefully maybe one of these days in person at an event. So thank you very much. Thank you. Have a great day, everybody.